<laughs> Hello everybody and thank you for joining us for our second Beat the Expert Monday for Shark Month. Um, so today we have conservationist and author Colin Speedy who's very kindly to offer to re-record our recording after there was an issue with the event on Monday. Um, so without further ado I'll hand over to Colin. Colin thank you very much. Yeah good morning. So yeah, if we can, we're just getting set up here. Um, and uh, trying to, thank you. Okay, right, yeah, well, good morning. And um, sorry about the uh, issues we had the other day, uh, especially because we had such a good turnout and people from all around the country. So that was really good. And uh, this is by way of a chance to set that right and hopefully give people something to watch while they're in lockdown. Uh, especially because the sharks are out there. So uh, yeah, my name's Colin Speedy. I've been involved in basking shark uh, conservation actions since probably the late 1970s, early 1980s. And, uh, you know, happy to see how things are going and I've uh, done a lot of surveys and so on and so forth. And i uh, going to tell you a little bit about that now. Um, so how do you advance this? Okay. Okay. Yep. Uh, so the basking shark. Well, the basking shark is is uh, our biggest fish. It's the second largest fish in the world, uh, and it can reach eleven meters in length. There are indeed even credible uh, records from the west coast of uh, North America of sharks reaching 12 meters. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a colossal creature and uh, is something as, as much myth as, as, as animal. They may live for 50 years. They feed only on zooplankton, um, and uh, which they forage for over considerable distances, as we'll see. And they appear in our waters in spring and summer. And uh, many of you be asking yourselves, you know, there have been a few sightings already in Cornwall, which is really good. Is that unusual? Well, no, this is the right time of year. This is when we would normally have expected to see them. Um, but uh, as the shark numbers have been relatively poor in, in re recent years in Cornwall, it's a good sign. So it's a really good thing. Let's hope it continues. Um, and uh, it's uh, an amazing creature. They can make ocean basin scale migrations. There aren't many sharks that have this capability. Whale sharks, uh, white sharks, tiger sharks, for example. And the basking shark joined this elite group when it was discovered that a shark that was tagged in the Isle of Man surfaced off Newfoundland, having covered 9,589 kilometers, an extraordinary journey. Uh, another one recently tagged um, off the Isle of Man, or, uh, off. Uh, Malin Head in uh, North, in uh, Ireland appeared uh, over in America as well. So you know they are they can make an, a transatlantic journey. Uh, tracking devices attached to the sharks showed that they can dive to uh, more than 1,200 meters, um, possibly more, we believe, which is an extraordinary adaptation. This is uh, something that very very few creatures can do. Sperm whales immediate, immediately spring to mind. Um, but uh, quite a special animal. So two sharks tagged off the New England coast by American researchers crossed the equator and arrived down off Brazil, and in fact, having crossed the equator. So there are large scale movements. Some of the sharks tagged in Scotland, for example, uh, head up and down to Morocco on a fairly regular basis. But the sharks classified as endangered in the Northeast Atlantic because it was very extensively hunted, which is something I'm going to talk about. Globally now, the basking shark is also tagged, uh, also uh, classified as endangered. So uh, it suffered very badly from overexploitation, and a lot of the rest of it is to do with the fact that we uh, we know very little about them outside some of these areas. But the waters of the west of Scotland, we know now, may be of vital importance for their future survival. Going back to the very first days when the sharks were discovered, uh, the first record of uh, a description of a basking shark, which was called Squalus Maximus, the great shark, was by uh, Johan Gunnarus, who was the Archbishop of Trondheim in Norway. And he took a very, very keen interest in the activities of his parishioners, many of whom were, were fishermen. And he heard about sharks that were being hunted, and he asked somebody to uh, get some drawings and make some 
uh, so he could see what he looked like. So he actually, this drawing was made from a record that was passed to him and was made into something that resembles a basking shark um, by uh, one of his colleagues. Uh, some of these basking sharks in the early days didn't actually look much like a basking shark, hence a lot of the sea monster story, stories that revolve around them. But very soon, uh, we recognized that the uh, Norwegian hunting activities had found their way across to Scotland. Now, well, that's not surprising because fishermen traveled and often fetched up in foreign ports and would have heard about people hunting these huge creatures. And by 1772, I think, um, they were already being hunted in Scotland, here in Loch Ranza on the Isle of Arran. And um, what you can see here shows a couple of things. One is that you know the, 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 the scale of it was very substantial. This was not just uh, a couple of guys going out in a boat and taking a chance on harpooning a shark. These were well-structured activities that were well supported with uh, those little sailing vessels there which are also acting as motherships. So clearly A they knew what they were doing and B there was a, an already well-established fishery. And this spread and indeed it looked to be so lucrative uh, that it spread right through the west of Scotland and the Scottish government of the time paid considerable amounts of money by way of subsidies to some of these guys you can see here like Donald MacLeod of Canna, David Campbell of Isla and Stuart of Butte in Loch Fyne uh, to set up pr practical basking shark fisheries of the kind you just saw in that last slide. And uh, there were other small scale fisheries as well which had probably been going on for some considerable time. Um, a lot of the people out in the Western Isles, for example, would have been uh, adept at driving uh, pilot whales ashore and so on and so forth. So there was a lot of expertise already. But these guys were set up to actually take basking sharks on a, an, an industrial scale, if you like. And the reason for that was that it was found that their liver oil, they have enormous bilobal livers, which um, weigh um, you know, nearly a third of the body, body weight, um, which when uh, heated and rendered down yield a really fine grade oil uh, which was used for many things. Uh, it was used for principally for as an embrocation for rubbing on injuries and on uh, aching limbs but mainly it was used uh, in lighting because it burns very cleanly like like whale oil, like sperm whale oil. It burns without smoke and so it was really really good for burning in the little cruisy lamps that people used in the uh, black houses at the time without uh, coughing and spluttering too much. So it was a, a, an extremely attractive thing. Latterly, it was used also for lighting city streets when mixed with rapeseed oil. So it had a considerable value, even in those very early days. Uh, and uh, even on places like the west of Ireland, for example, there were, you know, every village would have been hunting basket sharks. So uh, an important industry. And Coming along later, uh, as around the time of World War II, there were a number of um, gentlemen adventurers, if you like, who set up shark hunting. Um, prior to World War II, one particular individual, a guy called Anthony Watkins, who was the brother of a very famous polar explorer, Gina Watkins, set up in the Firth of Clyde and had a very successful operation uh, running in the years from 1935 and onwards. There had been a huge upswing in numbers uh, in basking sharks in Scotland prior to that, which is not that unusual. These, these cyclical appearances are fairly well recorded. There were long periods when there was no hunting whatsoever in Scotland, followed by periods when suddenly it took an upswing. So this was not a surprise, but it was, it was a, a really serendipitous thing for Watkins, who then went off to the war. But when he returned, he and his operation set up again and expanded, in fact, because the value of liver oil had increased stratospherically at that time, um, because whaling had ceased during the war, all but ceased, and fine grade oils of this type were very much in demand, not just for food, they were used for making margarine, so on, so on and so forth, but also too because they were found to have very low freezing point and could be used in things like high altitude aircraft oil. So in the years immediately after World War II, quite a number of these guys set up. Gavin Maxwell, of course, was more famous as the author of Ring of Bright Water that put otters on the map in terms of the conservation world in the beginning of the 1960s. Uh, Joseph Tex Geddes was, Tex was his uh, harpoon gunner and then carried on on his own 
another guy called Patrick Fitzgerald O'Connor uh, set up on the Isle of Col and uh, on hunting in, uh, he was from Col, but he was uh, hunting in around the whole area. Um, and then there were the fishermen from Malig uh, who were late to join in, but just as well for the sharks because they were easily the most efficient at, at their hunting. But most of all were the Norwegians who uh, came over in considerable numbers uh, just after World War II. Um, and these vessels were on their way to the west of Scotland for the hunt uh, when they were photographed. And the black stripe around the uh, crow's nest on them shows that they're actually uh, involved in minke whale hunting as well as basking shark hunting. So they would have had a seasonal hunt for the different species. Why would they have come all the way from Norway is an interesting question. Was it the case that they had hunted out the sharks in their area? And certainly that, I mean, from what we know, is, is quite likely. Uh, these guys were incredibly efficient at, at the job. Uh, they could take a shark, uh, harpoon it, hoist it, cut the livers out, and yield, put the carcass back into the water in around 10 minutes. Uh, so they were incredibly efficient compared with the, the Scottish fishermen. Um, and indeed, they came over here for, for many years, not just around the west of Scotland, but also the west of Ireland, and even down into the area between uh, Cornwall and Ireland in the, the latter years. So the scale of the catch in the, in the Northeast Atlantic was quite something. Um, in that period of 1946 to 53, the Scottish fishermen took around a thousand sharks. In Achill, which was where the main hunt was going on in the west of Ireland in the 1950s, they took an extraordinary number of sharks. Uh, they were using fishing nets uh, as a means of catching the sharks, and it was incredibly efficient and incredibly low cost, uh, run by little guys working in Irish skin boats called Curras. It was an extraordinary operation. The Norwegians, operating throughout Norway, uh, Shetland, around the west of Scotland, west of Ireland, down around southeast Ireland, took maybe uh, getting on for 70,000 sharks. The, there was a small scale Scottish fishery that resurrected during the 1970s, during the time of the oil crisis. And that carried on as far as 1994. And they, the, uh, the guy took nearly 333 sharks there. Down off Waterford, there was a, again, as a result of the oil crisis, there was a, a short lived recovery of the, the shark fishery there. Um, so, by the actual numbers recorded, you're looking at something like getting on for 82,000. But that was actually uh, very much an underestimate. The Norwegians worked out their uh, ratio of the number of animals that they took from the volume of liver oil and latterly from the number of fins, the, the, the weight of the fins that they took. Because by now the fins were the, where the money was. The fins were being exported for uh, use in the shark fin soup trade. So the real figure is somewhere over 100,000, which is an extraordinary number to take from an animal that was probably never that numerous anyway. So why was the responsibility for this? Well, the local hunters in Scotland couldn't make money once the value of the oil dropped dramatically. It was at one stage fetching the equivalent of 5,000 pounds a ton into the 2017 values, which is an extraordinary amount of money for uh, a, an oil. Uh, the Norwegians and Irish were able to survive for far longer at far lower cost because they, they were so efficient. Uh, if you can, you know, the Norwegian fleet could take 10 sharks per boat per hour, you know, you would wipe out a shoal in very little time. And indeed, in Ackle Island, where they were only using very dog and stick operation uh, with, with nets, it was just the repair of the nets and the pay for the guys that were operating the boats. It was very, very low cost. And they were taking 250 tons a year, which was more in one year than the entire Scottish fishery in uh, post-war combined. So with the Norwegian fit, fleet operating uh, so efficiently out there, the major damage in the Northeast Atlantic wasn't just caused in Scotland, but effects were felt there uh, just the same. Coming to the 1990s, I'd been involved in basking shark surveys, um, working with people like the Marine Conservation Society, um, since the 1980s and indeed you know I was working as a commercial yacht skipper latterly and uh, I was very keen to get back involved with uh, research work and we were able to get some funding from the wildlife trusts and were able to set up our project using a 40-foot boat and surveying around the west of Britain 
Um, and what we were really doing was going out and looking for to see if we could find what was left. What, you know, indeed, were there still hotspots? The shark hunters all wrote books about their exploits and they all left a very good paper trail of where they'd been. But what we didn't really know, because most of the places they'd been to were not uh, close enough to land for us to know from public sighting schemes what was going on. So the next best thing was to have a boat based scheme, and that's what we did. And starting in the English Channel each summer, um, at the end of April, we would work our way uh, around Devon and Cornwall, up uh, to Wales, through the Irish Sea, the Firth of Clyde, and then into Scotland, and in particular, this key area called the Sea of the Hebrides up on the northwest coast. And this is what we found during the main period we were operating there between 2002 2000, 2006. And what you're looking at here is uh, a simple uh, reflection of sharks per hour. How many sharks do you see in an hour? It's a very good way of measuring um, what is called effort. Uh, we could equally, equally be measuring sharks per kilometer traveled or whatever, but basically what it shows is where you have higher concentrations. And in open water, you're looking at very, very low numbers, something like 0.001 sharks per hour, whereas you can see See here where the red blocks are, you're looking at uh, three or more sharks per hour, which is a remarkable um, number. But that's not really that in number. And the numbers we were seeing in the area around Col and Tyree and around Canna and High Skier um, were, of course, very very, very high, but consistently very, very high. And that was the big difference, really. Um, so that showed that they were important year on year. Also, too, this shows the number of animals seen in shoals from solitary sharks and two and threes right up to 50 plus individuals. And you'll see that the, the white areas on the solitary sharks and individuals, that, well, that's just about all the areas. The dark blue and the hatched blue reflect those two areas, Colin Tyree and High Skier and Canna. And it shows that that was where we saw all of the shoals. That was also, too, an interesting place because we saw an extraordinary number of big sharks uh, in that area. Um, public sighting schemes tended to show that the average size of sharks was somewhere between four and six meters. In actual fact, our sightings from boats when measuring much more accurately were quite higher. We did occasionally see these very young sharks. This is a, a neonate, um, about 1.6 meters in length that landed up on the shore of uh, Northern Ireland. Um, but you don't really see these very often. They're, they're quite scarce. There's no evidence of parental involvement. They're on their own, five or six of them live pups born uh, every few years, and they are out there and hunting. And they have this very strange curled up nose on them. They're really weird looking little creatures. Um, so this was what we had in terms of the sightings that we saw. Uh, which, as you can see there, seven and eight meter sharks, far more of those. So this was a, the shoals were full of big mature animals. And this was really interesting. Uh, and this is what we, we were seeing when we were out there. This is what's called courtship-like behavior, which is a form of social behavior that sharks engage in, where they swim nose to tail, sometimes rubbing against each other, parallel swimming, many other things. Uh, sometimes you see long strings of sharks like that, and indeed other sharks are beneath them in the water. Uh, we don't fully understand what is involved. In, in fact, um, some researchers are working currently using uh, critter cams and uh, ROVs to understand more about social behavior below, below the water. Uh, also, too, we saw lots and lots of breaching. Breaching we always associated with seeing big shoals. In fact, in 1999 in Cornwall, which is when we had the last big peak in Cornwall, we saw over 100 sharks, but we recorded something like 60 breaches over a season, which was just amazing. But there were lots of short shoals about around Land's End in particular, and also, too, we were seeing lots of social behavior. So that was consistent, same sort of thing that we were seeing in Scotland, except in Scotland we were seeing it on a very consistent basis. And it's worth considering that, you know, this is uh, probably five or six tons of uh, fish leaping here, and the sharks had absolutely no idea uh, boats being around them or anything of that nature. You have to be very careful if you see sharks breaching and uh, if you're in a boat, move away because they really aren't the brightest, uh, brightest creatures in the ocean. 
So what was unique about Scotland, we were seeing consistently high values. 65% of the animals were of sexually mature size, so big mature animals. So this was potentially the reproductive group. The only sites we had where we saw substantial shoals and courtship and breaching. So for us, we argued that these were critical hotspot sites for the species. And that led to uh, a lot of interest on the, the behalf of uh, the Scottish government through Scottish natural heritage to set up a much more structured approach. So just going through then, what, you know, what threats remain? Well, there are a number. Bycatch is one. Uh, as we know from the Ackill Island experience, uh, sharks get entangled in nets. That, the nets are set for fish. Unfortunately for us, even a basking shark won't go through them. They tend to tow them and dive and expire. Um, so it's very localized in, in its pretty small scale. Uh, sharks sometimes get caught up in pot ropes. Um, as I said already, they're not necessarily the sharpest knives in the drawer, and they seem to have an uncanny ability to get entangled. But, you know, this is, this is accidental. It's, it's not deliberate, and it's a, a nuisance for everyone. Um, and we hope that it'll, it'll maintain that small scale. Uh, collision with boats is another issue. And um, it's partly because some of the places that sharks like to gather, where there are tidal and thermal fronts, are around headlands. And headlands are natural roundabouts where there's a lot of boat traffic and, uh, you know, the sharks are there. And they're not always at the surface. Sometimes all you can see is just the tip of the dorsal fin. And so unless you're keeping a very careful lookout in these areas, it's quite possible to collide with them. And boats do, and, you know, boats get damaged. So it's a threat for people too. Um, sometimes the sharks suffer some quite substantial injuries. This is a pretty big shark that had some bucket-sized chunks knocked out of its back. Probably a slow-turning propeller had done that. But it was swimming around fine and, and uh, seemed to be okay. The sort of thing that we've tried to do with some of the data that we gathered is to provide information to mariners, to uh, areas where uh, there are high likelihood of uh, encountering sharks. So this was uh, something that was done for a powerboat race, showing inside the area of the outer red line and where the red hatch lines are, these were critical areas. This is where we had to establish from our own survey work that you are most likely to see um, encounter a basking shark. And what we didn't want was high speed small boats going through inside that area, potentially colliding with sharks and injuring the sharks, but also too resulting in damage and potentially even loss of life to the boats. So what do we recommend if you're out there and at the moment and you, you're getting to see these sharks arriving in the area? They don't like being approached from right behind them or from straight ahead of them. That acts as a, a threat. And their eyes are set on the head so they don't really see anything coming up from behind them. So slow down if you see a shark and uh, don't go any closer than 100 meters. Keep your engine out of gear because then the, the threat of the propeller turning and injuring the animal is taken away. And don't cut across ahead of them because they really aren't very smart um, and they tend to turn towards you when you least need it. So don't stay longer than 15 minutes and then move away and leave them, leave them be. Uh, that is from our WISE scheme project, which uh, helps people to avoid injuries and collision with animals. Uh, another issue at the moment is zooplankton. Um, it used to be that we would see lots and lots of um, zooplankton early on in the season, rather as we are now here, um, Calanus thinmarchicus and Helgolandicus. And uh, that was what we called the spring bloom when I was a kid. And suddenly everything just kicked off. There were birds and, and basking sharks and all sorts of things everywhere. Mackerel were coming in. It was really good. Now that's changed distribution during my lifetime, say from the mid-60s onwards, and thinmarchicus which prefers colder temperatures is now further north. And the old spring bloom is much weaker. Um, and you get shallow blooms of, of warmer water preferring Helgolandicus after that. So some of them may be too late in the summer when stratifications occurred. Um, but down here, certainly you've got uh, a situation where we used to get around every 10 years, you would have a cycle of good, good, good numbers of sightings really haven't had any good years since about 2000, 2001 at the latest. After that, things went very quiet. And ever since then, it's been very quiet, which is quite strange in itself. But Scotland has been consistently good in that time. Although some of us think that actually the numbers that are being recorded up there 
may not be as many as they were. And indeed, we're hearing rep reports of uh, sharks being sighted as far north as Iceland. So this may be to do with uh, shifting uh, plankton abundance, which the sharks will follow um, because of climate change. So will we see the sharks in numbers in Cornwall again? Let's hope so. I mean, we're off to a good start this year. Um, <clears throat> the, we, when we passed the baton on from the survey work that we had done, which is very simple stuff, boat-based surveys, we then went to uh, another Cornish institution up at Tremo, the, uh, the University of Exeter up at Tremo campus, where, where the excellent team up there who had wonderful experience with uh, tracking of animals like turtles, for example, were ideally placed to actually go up and start attaching a variety of different types of uh, satellite tracking equipment to the sharks up in Scotland, and, and that was really good. Um, so uh, the likes of uh, Phil Doherty here, Matthew Witt, Brendan Godley, Lucy Hawkes were all very much involved in uh, getting this project off the ground and have done some amazing work uh, up there. This is uh, actually when you're attaching a tag on a big shark here, but also scouring the dorsal fin for genetic material, um, which I'll touch on later. Um, and here's some of the, the uh, results from that. You can see that some of the sharks that were tagged up in the far northwest of the UK there moved around from the area uh, in around Colin Tyree and High Steer where they were tagged, but went uh, out of season way out down south and ranged around some of them moving back into the area at the end of the season and the, in following seasons. Um, so some of the sharks do make these long journeys. We're not really quite sure why. Um, it may be because there's uh, the warmer regime is more, uh, warmer water temperature regime is more favorable. Um, they may be just tracking plankton. Um, but here you can see uh, over a period of years, 2012 to 2014, how the shark, some of the sharks tagged in those areas, remained in those areas. And indeed, now we know that some of the sharks that were tagged in those areas returned uh, over seasons. And this has been shown in the Isle of Man as well, that uh, there is far more site fidelity uh, involved with some of these animals than we had first suspected. Um, currently, there is a, a proposal for a marine protected area in the Sea of the Hebrides. And this will be a first if, if it goes ahead. And, and I'm hopeful that it will. Uh, because it, it will be uh, for a non-resident, if you like. And it's going to be, uh, the proposal is for minke whales as well as basking sharks. And it reflects partially the fact that these animals have a, uh, a major ecotourism value now and uh, therefore are of considerable importance to the economy up there. So uh, this is uh, the hatched area that encompasses nearly all you can see here is the area for the proposed MPA. And uh, as I say, that would be uh, a real first, but it's largely been built on the basis. And this, this data here shows uh, information from aerial surveys, boat-based surveys, public surveys, and uh, all of the uh, uh, tracking data. So this shows very much where the animals are, are uh, likely to be found. And so we now have a, a really good handle, even on a very fine scale, of where these large-scale hotspot densities are. And of course, they reflect exactly the places that we saw in the earliest days of the hunter um, around Canna and High Skier, where Donald McLeod was based, and uh, down at Isla as well, heading up into the waters around Colin and Tyree. So yes, you know, the truth of it was that the, many of the areas that were good remain good, but there's still some real mysteries out there, um, one of which astonished us was that over the four or five years that we were there, we were going to some of the most important hunting sites of all uh, on a regular basis. And people like Gavin Maxwell talked about this lonely spot on uh, the uh, northeastern shore of South Uist called the uh, Ushanish Lighthouse and um, the bay that was uh, Shepherd's Bight in behind it. And he said that they hunted there for days without end uh, and equally over at Moonan Bay on Sky. And yet in all the time that we were in those areas, we covered this area consistently and as far as we could equally, uh, we never once saw a shark in either of those two places. And this all seemed extraordinary. Um, but some of the latest genetic work tends to bear a, a comment that was made by um, Tex Geddes, who said 
that some of these uh, some of the animals he believed were in what he called families and had very different markings from each other and who knows i mean these were observant guys they were very very efficient at, at what they did and uh, you know some of the genetic material that's showing now shows that certainly on a larger scale um, yeah it would appear that there are families that charts around the isle of man sometimes come up to scotland but many of them actually remain and return in those areas so who knows there are many many mysteries out there about the rasking shark many questions that remain unanswered uh, and it remains a fascinating subject and happily the right people are actually working the team so congratulations to lily and lieber for example for a fantastic piece of work uh, looking at the genetic spread of the rasking shark um, ghosts of hunting past this is what's left of Gavin Maxwell's shark factory on the island of Soy. And uh, to this day, you can see the, the uh, old locomotive boiler that was up there that was used for providing the power to pull the sharks up the slipway and then to provide the steam to render the livers down. This was an extraordinary story that probably could have only happened in one of these incredible periods of, of uh, financial constraint and everything. And in the World War II world where people were desperate for excitement. But it's happily over now, and we hope that the MPA will go ahead and that it will be something that will enable people to come and see sharks in perpetuity. Because as we all know down here too, uh, they are the great one of the great wonders of the ocean. So hopefully they will be safe at last and uh, we'll all be able to enjoy them in the future. And let's hope that Cornwall has a fabulous season here and thank you all very much for coming along and and listening to my presentation i hope you find it educational and fun and uh, anybody who wants to read a lot more of course is very welcome to go and buy my book so thank you very much and uh, have a great summer thank you very much colin that's brilliant um if you could just uh, go to the top of your screen and unshare your screen um and I will, um, I'll just run through some of the questions that we have. Sure, yeah. I have some questions from our previous, um, from the previous presentation. Um, so one was from Finlay, who I know that you oh, know. Yeah. And he Hi, asked, he asked um, the first question was, um, how, do we, how do we know where the plankton is? But you also followed up with how do the sharks know where the plankton is? Okay, well, um, there is a wonderful project called the uh, Continuous Plankton Recorder scheme run by the Sir Alastair, Alastair Hardy Foundation for Ocean Science in Plymouth. And it's a wonderful project. It's been running for over 100 years, uh, recording plankton densities around the world. And it, therefore, we are lucky that we have that resource to tell us where plankton is and where plankton's shifting. That's how you can, you can tell. I mean, you can use a lot of satellite tracking now, I'm sure, but uh, that, that is the major resource. Um, equally, uh, you know, how do the sharks find them? Well, they use a number of features. One is that they, they are obviously use uh, temperature as a cue. And some of the areas that they like to find, like uh, thermal fronts, of course, there are temperature gradients and they're pretty efficient at finding those. And it's been argued that they may use those fronts as a, a kind of a route map, as a, a tunnel, if you like, to find their way to the best patches of plankton. Um, they do seem to have this uncanny ability to find their way back, even having been down off Portugal all the way back to, you know, within a couple of miles of where they were the year before, uh, around the Isle of Man or around Con and Tyree. So there's that. Then uh, they forage vertically as well as horizontally. So they, that's why they make these deep dives. They're looking for prey um, because plankton doesn't just disappear. It can descend in, into uh, deeper water in winter. So a lot of the sharks go out onto the shelf break where it's deeper and forage up and down the shelf break. Um, and they're probably using uh, smell trails to plow, find the plankton there. They have a phenomenal sense of smell, olfaction, and also to uh, electroreception. So they can pick up uh, muscle activity generating minute electrical currents. So that's, you know, that's how they can fine tune their way to, um, to the best patches of plankton. Brilliant. Um, we did have a few more questions, but we've actually, we're coming to the end of our, our time on Zoom. Oh. Um, and I think a lot of the questions that we had before, you've managed to answer <laughs> through the presentation. Time. Um, so yeah. yeah, just thank you so much again for, uh, for your time and for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Um, and yeah, as uh, Colin had on his 
final slide, we've got another couple of Meet the Expert Mondays during April 2020. Lucy mm. Harding on the 20th and Charles Hood on the 20th. Great, great people too. Don't yeah. <laughs> yeah, really looking forward to them. So yeah, thank you so much and thank you to everybody for watching. And yeah, hopefully we'll see you soon.